couple of special guests. I don't want to say that we saved the best for last because uh, the guests on last week's Mission Log were fantastic. Um, I will say the next one is pretty good. We spent an hour last week talking with Gates McFadden, uh, the next generation's own Dr. Beverly Crusher. Why was she on the show? Why was she off the show? Uh, what does Star Trek mean to her? And believe it or not, she's done stuff outside of the Star Trek universe. So we talked about all of that stuff and so much more uh, in our conversation with Gates. Uh, that'll turn up in the Mission Log feed this Thursday. The next Thursday, we will finally dock at Deep Space Nine. Uh, so that is uh, one of the things that we're up to. Uh, John, won't you please tell us about another? I will. That was thing number one. This is thing number two. Thing number two Let's say you're in Los Angeles, or, or let's say you're near Los Angeles, or let's say you're somewhere else in the world, but you'd like to spend some time in Los Angeles. Well, come this weekend, specifically Sunday, March 11th, there's a bar at Hollywood and La Cienega called Scum and Villainy, themed after that other large science fiction franchise, and Roddenberry wanted to team up. So we're hosting a night of diversity in the true spirit of Idic to celebrate fandom of all stripes. There will be costumes, there will be giveaways, there will be an interactive art project. There will be us, yes, us. We will be hopping on the mic and playing MC for a little while, doing a special mission log report from the party. There will be celebrity guests on air with us, hosts from Priority One and the Trek Files here on the Roddenberry Podcast Network, and you. You will be on the air with us because you'll be there and we'll talk to you in person in costume probably at that very party. So you can get details at roddenberry.com or on our Facebook events page. There is a cover charge and all profits will go to charity. So let's make this a good one because we want to do more. Now, as far as we're up to uh, what we're up to tonight, we have a fairly open format. Yes, we do have a guest. Author Dayton Ward will be in here in just a bit. Uh, we have questions asked about writing in general and writing Star Trek in particular. And if you have those kinds of questions as well, we definitely want you to ask them. But if you just have a regular, you know, Trek type topic that you've been hoping to hit, uh, we want those questions too. So uh, share your thoughts, get Dayton's and our thoughts as well. It'll be a Titanic Trek talk and other things alliterative. So how do you call in? Well, I'm so glad you asked because it's really quite simple. There is a link in the Facebook description and comments. Click that and you'll be part of our Zoom meeting. You can also use the iPhone one tap, which will connect you, or you can just straight up dial your telephone the way Alexander Graham Bell does, 646-558-8656. You'll need to enter the meeting code, which we have in the show notes, and then you'll meet our lovely and talented technical director who will patch you in. Remember, if you're watching us live tonight, we do thank you. And we do hope that you will like and share this feed. Uh, the more times you do that, the more people find us and the more fun we get to have and the more people having fun with you. Um, if you happen to miss the live show, but you can still hear me, how? Okay, you probably found a way to download it. Uh, yeah, or, or watch it again, because uh, Facebook or YouTube.com slash Roddenberry Prod will have this video almost as soon as we're done doing the video live. Uh, you can also just grab the audio-only feed. Uh, you can subscribe to it absolutely three, uh, free rather, through Apple Podcasts or by going to podcast.roddenberry.com. And as I said before, if you are watching live, please hit like, please hit share, because these things please ball. Hey, by the way, uh, before we get to your calls um, and before we get to the business, before we get to the calls, Ken, can I just say that you mentioned that we've had guests on and we have guests coming up. One of those guests watching right now. Hello, Tracy Lee Coco. Glad wow. to see you there. I'm glad yeah. to see you seeing us here because <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you on. Everybody who's listening right now, if you haven't, please go back and download the supplemental in which we interviewed Tracy and Matthew Corey to uh, do some of our TNG wrap up. It was a blast. Yeah. We also so, did our, uh, our top 10 episodes of TNG covering only about 25 episodes. Yeah, that's about right. That's good. Good, good uh, ability to really wrangle in the numbers on that one, Ken. So uh, before we get to your calls, we'd like to remind you about our new shop, tpublic.com slash user slash mission log, or you just go to missionlogpodcast.com and click on shop. 
Carl Huber, our designer extraordinaire, is cranking out a ton of stuff for our shop. Uh, like, like what, Ken? Like what is Carl cranking out? Well, he's got, of course, the uh, bonk bonk on the head since 1966 uh, shirt. That's the you see Timmy moment uh, where I think a kid has actually been bonk bonked on the head. The illustration is really open for your interpretation. Uh, there is a, a T-shirt commemorating Nova Squadron. Oh, and the fantastic time they had. <clears throat> and then there are some old favorites. Uh, cool as Kirk. Cool as Kirk's been selling pretty well lately. I've noticed it that. Has, more and more orders for that one. Uh, Ethos, Pathos, and Logos. And my personal favorite, uh, the Ditalics Mining Corporation, because at Ditalics Mining, what's yours is mined. So all those designs and more at missionlogpodcast.com. They're not just for t-shirts. They're on mugs and stickers and notebooks and tapestries, just tons of stuff to check out and make your own truly unique trek ish gear <laughs> get yours today <laughs> at missionlogpodcast.com hey ken uh we have a poll i believe we do well we have the results yeah. of last week's poll and then we have one for this week as well okay uh, last week well last week i say two weeks ago because we did take that one week off uh, the last poll that we had was discovery was it good for you and uh, most everybody said yes. 81% say yes. Season one of Discovery was good for them. 19% say, sadly, uh, it was not. Well, actually, they didn't say, sadly, it was not. They just said it wasn't. But uh, yeah. <laughs> They might have been thinking, sadly. They, they, they might have been thinking, sadly, yes. Or they might have been thinking happily how sad they were. Anyway, that was the last poll. We got another poll this week, John. Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, it kind of themed to tonight's discussion with uh, with our special guest, Dayton Ward. It's about the Star Trek novels. Now, Ken, you and I, we don't cover the novels in Mission Log, but uh, we certainly are aware that they exist. And we know that our listeners are well aware that they exist. Star Trek novels, should they be canon? I, I, I apologize. Is that being too provocative with our question? Well, right now, 30% of you say canon. 70% of you say not canon. And I think <clears> we will probably have some some thoughts on that as we carry along. So now is a perfect time, everybody, to make sure that you are calling in, you're using that Zoom link, you're dialing in, so you can be part of the conversation with us. And I guess without further ado, Ken, it's about time to welcome our guest, should we not? Dayton Ward, he is the New York Times best-selling author or co-author of literally dozens of Star Trek books spanning many time periods and storylines of the Trek universe. You may have heard of his Starfleet Corps of Engineers or Vanguard series, or you may have recently discovered his Star Trek Discovery tie in novel, the recently released Drastic Measures. When he's not writing Trek, he's leaving snarky comments on Facebook all the way from Stately Ward Manor. Please welcome Dayton Ward. Dayton, are you there, my friend? Hey, I'm here. How are you guys doing? We're well. Doing well. We're Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, you look great, by the way. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, I just had a makeover. <laughs> it's, it, it works for you. It's good. Yeah, it's good. I thought I had the camera thing going. I had I reinstalled drivers and everything, and it's and it and it flared to life for a moment and then died again. So I don't know what's going on with it. Hey, uh, but before we get to our questions here, Aaron Harvey says that uh, you wrote that rock opera about Spock. <laughs> How do I? Do Wait, what is this? Do I uh, do I know uh, about this? Well, I mean, it, it's it, it's 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 sort of a, a long story. Uh, we did it as an April Fool's gag. We came up with the idea, Kevin and I, that uh, we created a rock opera for Star Trek called Spock of Ages, and we nice. had we had Aaron create the uh, poster art for it, which is basically Spock as the Starman from the Rush symbol, oh. you know, twenty one twelve. So he's doing the thing while staring at a Starfleet emblem. So that was our, uh, we were, we were actually able to convince people it was the real thing. So <laughs> nice. nice. Well, I thought an idiot because I was going to ask, did you actually write the opera? Or did you just come up with the poster? We came up with a poster and then we actually, Kevin actually wrote a song <laughs> to go with it. So, I mean, he, he was, he, 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 uh, he went all in on it. So I was content <laughs> to fool people with a poster and leave it at that, but he actually wrote music. So <laughs> nice. that's pretty amazing. I guess we should have told people that we're actually going to be performing that at Scum and Villainy. <laughs> Go for it. There's going to be somebody out there that'll fall for it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, not to, well, I don't know. 
we're going to talk a whole lot of Star Trek stuff, but I'm curious about anybody who decides to write or anybody who can, honestly. Take us back to the beginning uh, for you personally. How and when did you actually start writing as like, hey, I'm a writer now. I'm going to write. This is what I do. Well, I'll let you know when that moment arrives. Um, nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are people out there who would who would tell you that that moment has not yet arrived and never will arrive. Um, <clears throat> as far as me writing, I never actually had a a thought that I would write professionally. You know, like like I would write something and people would pay me for it. I never had that dream. Uh, I started writing for fun back twenty five years ago, thirty years ago, just as a creative outlet. And then um, the first Strange New Worlds contest for pocketbooks came along, you know, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. They had a writing contest for unpublished writers that you might be able to get your Star Trek story published. So I entered that first contest, and lo and behold, they bought my story. And uh, then they bought the next two for the succeeding years in the contest, at, the, at which point they offered me a novel contract. And that's back in 2000, and I've been doing it ever since. No, you say that that so that first contest was a Star Trek contest. Were you always writing Star Trek? I mean, like when you wrote for fun, were you like, was it always Star Trek stuff or was it other things? And then you eventually found your way to Trek. I wrote a few Star Trek stories and I wrote some other stories which were in hindsight laughably bad. Um, but then again, every writer who starts out has those stories in a trunk somewhere. Um, and then the first contest came along and I was talked into doing it by a friend of mine. She convinced me to submit a story. So I rolled the dice and saw what happened. And lo and behold, here we are 20 odd years later. So uh, uh, walk us through then I, for 20 odd years now working on Star Trek novels. Um, you know, this is going to be a big part of our discussion tonight. But, but, but tell us about the process here of writing within an established universe. You know, you've got characters and, and scenarios and locations sort of handed to you that millions of people already know. So guide us a little bit through what you do. You know, you're, you're coming up with something wholly on your own um, that then may or may not fit to within what the license owner wants, or they're coming to you and saying, hey, we have this thing, we need to fit a story into this, and, and, and vice versa. All of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of that can all of that can happen depending on the project. Any any or all of that or any combination of that can happen depending on the, the the given project. Generally how it works is that the writer will submit an idea and the editor will bat it around and decide whether they like it or not. And then if 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 they like the initial idea, then the writer will flesh out that idea to an outline, you know, 12, 15 pages or something that basically beat by beat breaks down the whole plot of what they think the novel's going to be. And then once the editor likes that, they give it to the studio, the, the owner of the property, in this case, you know, CBS for Star Trek. And then Star Trek has an office of uh, folks who are, that's all they do is vet licensed products. So the, and, and John Ben Sitters and his crew vet all the manuscripts and all the outlines for stuff like books and comics and everything else. And if they like it, then we get the green light and I get told to start writing. Now, there are also the situations where the editor will come and go, well, we're having this big five book miniseries thing come out, you know, in a year and a half. And I want you to write the next generation book in that series, or I want you to write the DS9 book in that series. Uh, and I want you to do something with the Andorians go. And then I have to go to my corner and come up with an idea that fits those dots. And then, of course, fits with all the other books that are also being developed by other writers at the same time. So, yeah, it can be a little chaotic sometimes. But there's something, I mean, forgive me, I don't want to assume. I, I, well, I did want to ask, actually. Um, in particular, I mean, with Discovery, it feels like that's that's going to be working sort of a different way. And I'll tell you why I think so or why I suspect so. Um, in David Mack's book, uh, Desperate Hours, there is a thing that happens. And then we hear basically Burnham's telling of that in uh, episode 15 of Discovery. And so it, was, it, it seemed obvious that there was a bit more of a lockstep thing going on because so many of the Star Trek novels are written years after, you know, mm -hmm. the original series has been off for, you know, however long it's been off now. Same with DS9, same with uh, same with Voyager. And I can keep naming Star Trek series, but I won't. No, I mean, you're so, right. So it's, been, it's been a much closer thing this time, right? 
Yeah, this time is much different. What I the process I described was the general way it happened for all of the other Star Trek series because as you as you pointed out, they're generally written in at least in the case of Star Trek, you know, years after the original show has wrapped, whichever series that you're tying into. Uh, Discovery is a different animal um, because not only was the show in production, which is the f- first for me writing a novel for one of the shows that's actively in production, but it was in development at the same time. They were literally figuring it out while we were figuring out what our novel was going to be. So there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of talking on the phone, a lot of emails, a lot of texts. You know, some of them, <laughs> some of them rather angry, because <laughs> or or not angry, but pointed. As we were trying to arrive at whatever uh, whatever it was we were talking about, no, it was a much more uh, hands-on relationship on on the part of the writing staff with respect to these novels, um, and I I actually enjoyed that part of the process because I, I at the same time I'm sitting here watching them put the show together, build the show, and I'm so I'm privy to all the cool things that are happening behind the scenes. At the same time, they're you know they're helping me get my novel whipped into shape. Um, I, I'm glad that you addressed that because actually one of our listeners, uh, Jerry, uh, who just chimed in on the Facebook chat says, uh, I'd really like to ask Dayton what his relationship with the producers and the development of the series was as he wrote. Uh, did he have behind the scenes access? Yes. Sounds like you did. Did he always know he was writing about a different character than the Lorca we were seeing on screen? When did the epilogue come into play? And is that canon? I hope it is. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so let's try to break those down and get and take them one at a time. And make sure we don't miss anything. So, okay. uh, what was the first question? Do they? Uh, what do was you my have relationship to the producers? Yes, you, you you have a relationship with them. You you have conversations with them. Um, I had a yeah. I had a relationship with the writing staff in in the persona of mostly Kirsten Beyer, uh, who of course is also a Star Trek novelist of uh, some renown. Right. Um, so she was our point person. She was the one that was elected or drafted or volunteered or, you know, sentenced to hell by having to deal <laughs> with the novels and the comics while also working on the staff of the show. Um, so she was our point of contact if we had any kind of questions res- with respect to what they were doing with the show itself. Um, and she and I have been friends for years. So it was an easy relationship, uh, an easy back and forth. Um, as far as access to the production, yes, we, we were keyed in to scripts and production art and set photography and in a couple of limited cases, some video, you know, raw video uh, while we were writing. Uh, I was, the show was much further along in the production process when I was writing my novel than when Dave was writing his. Um, so when I was writing my book, yes, I did know about the big twists that were coming. Uh, nice. I knew I knew what was going on with with Lorca, and you know, of course, I'm under like 17 NDAs, and they've got ninjas <laughs> parked outside my house, hiding in the hedges, <laughs> and snipers on the roof across the street, and so I'm not allowed to say or type or text or Facebook anything that that indicates I have any knowledge of the show, uh, and I I operated that way for over a year before they finally announced that I was working on the book. Wow. Well, all right, Jerry, I hope that answers the, uh, the question you had there. And uh, funny, by the way, this one's for you, Ken. Uh, Mark Hill says, Ken's party game is naming Trek episodes other than the Corp and Mike Maneuver. So uh, I hope everybody took a shot uh, when you... I don't. Uh, no. Do I yeah. Do I know the names of any episodes besides the Corp and Mike Maneuver? Uh, it might, maybe by accident. You just you, you drop one and you, you don't know. <laughs> like... That's yeah. possible. That's possible. Yeah. Hey, uh, for people watching right now, I want to remind you that uh, you can give us a call and and you can ask a question about writing and ask a question about the Star Trek novels. Or, you know, I get the sense that Dayton Ward is actually a Star Trek fan. So if you have another kind of Star Trek question you'd like to ask, uh, you know, you can click on that link uh, right there above and below the video you're watching right now. You can pick up the phone also and dial 646-558-8656. That number again, 646-558-8656. You'll need to enter the uh, meeting code, uh, which we have in the show notes, or you can just have the uh, the one touch on your uh, smartphone and get straight in touch with us that way. I'm curious, you got to do something interesting with your novel that um, a lot of times hasn't been done. Like you read David's uh, novel and he's writing about Saru and we knew about Saru. He's writing about Spock and we know about Spock. You're writing about Giorgio and we know about Giorgio. Uh, you're writing about Prime Universe Lorca. 
which is not a completely different character, but we've never seen him before your book, I don't think. What is it like to write about, I mean, he's going to be, whether he turns up in season two, season three, season five, whatever, uh, that's going to be an important character to things that happen on Discovery just because we've seen his opposite antithesis, his reflection, whatever you want to call that. What's it, write, what's it like writing for a character that we both know and don't know? Well, in some ways, it was almost like creating a new character, uh, like you would with original fiction, or if we make up, you know, like one of the novel spinoffs that we do, like Vanguard or the Starfleet Corps of Engineers. Um, at the same time, the writing staff had their own ideas, obviously, about what they thought Mir or Prime Lorca would be like. So, you know, that was he was the subject of many conversations, uh, particularly uh, when it became when I was clued into the fact that, oh, hey, by the way, <laughs> this is what's going to happen with Lorca during the show. I'm like, oh, wow, that doesn't screw up me up at all. Because uh, <laughs> I didn't know it at the beginning. I knew it later on. Um, but as it happens, it didn't really impact what I was doing too much uh, because, you know, there was no chance of, at least in the first season, his characterization not being in sync with what I was writing on the page or vice versa. Um it was it was a little weird because I didn't know how it was going to be received. We were all kind of wondering, how's this going to go when everybody re figures out that you know they've been looking at the wrong Lorca for all these episodes? How's that going to affect the book? It it did affect the placement of when the book was going to be published. I mean, it factored into when the book was published because we didn't want it to uh, come out before the reveal uh, with Lorca. When I say we, I mean they. I had no input to the conversation at all, other than yeah, sure, whatever works for you guys. <laughs> um, so it was an interesting, uh, interesting little puzzle. I mean, it was uh, something that we talked about. But as far as characterization, um, I stuck, you know, with with the notes that Kirsten gave me as far as her insights into the real care into I keep saying real prime Lorca. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's a, this it's at a point earlier in his career. It's ten years before the show, so there's plenty of wiggle room in there for other things to happen to Prime Lorca before uh, the switch is made. Because uh, we don't know, we don't know when the switch was made. They have their ideas on when it was made, uh, but they haven't come right out and said it. And of course, I can't tell you. Otherwise, the right. ninja will come in through my window. <laughs> um, I see him. I see you, little bastard. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting and fun at the same time. I don't know what they're going to do. I, at this point, I don't know what's shaping up for season two. Yeah, well, I, and even if you did, of course, we couldn't ask you. I do wonder, though, were you tempted to give um, Prime Lorca anything crazy in the hopes that you would have to see Jason Isaac do it <laughs> <laughs> in season two or season three? Should I, Prime um... ever turn up? I was tempted briefly, but then, you know, I, I knew that it would never get past the 17 sets of eyes that were going to go over this manuscript. That's another thing that's different about writing this novel versus all the other Trek novels is the number of people who had approval and buy-in. Uh, mm. Normally, it's the editor and then a representative from licensing. This time, it's those two people plus at least two or three people from the writing staff and possibly the exec, you know, the, the producers. Um, I didn't, in, I didn't get to interact with any of those other individuals uh, except for Kirsten. Uh, but I was told that, yes, it ran the gamut and then came back down and I'd get a couple of notes and then I'd run it back up the chain and they'd file it back down. And we did this a few times until everybody was happy. So. Uh, I, I want to switch gears just a little bit because uh, obviously discovery is the new thing. It's the current thing. But you've written so much across all the series and uh, um, well, first of all, the obvious question: Do you have a favorite series or time frame to work from? As a fan, my favorite is the original. That's the one I grew up with. That's that's what I think of when you say Star Trek. I immediately think of Kirk and the gang. Uh, as far as writing, it's sort of a toss up. I like writing for the original folks, but I also uh, get the chance to write for Picard and the Enterprise after the movie time frame. And I've really started to enjoy in the past several years or the past few years that setting uh, where it's beyond the movie. We're able to do things with the characters that we could have never done while they were making the series or any of the films. Uh, so they're giving us a, a very wide latitude with respect to developing those characters beyond what you saw on screen. Well, do you find uh, that there's anything confining about that? I mean, it, it, even with TOS, you've got, okay, you have the three seasons out of the potentially five 
you know, five years of the five-year mission. You've got that in-between time between the five-year mission and the motion picture. Uh, you, you know, it seems like there have been so many books and so many stories told about that period. So what is your approach to just sort of push all of that out of your mind and say, look, I'm just going to do something fresh, new. I, I, I don't really care precisely trying to squeeze that into something that has already been written before? I used to obsess about where everything fit together, you know, in the timeline or a chronology. I used to used to figure out where each novel took place in conjunction with an episode or this comic book story along with this novel, along with this episode. And after a while, it, it's a little maddening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because like you say, you know, if we were to string all these together, it, it's like over the course of the five-year mission, Kirk and the gang ran into some adventure about every 17 minutes, you know, so, and they, and they didn't sleep at all during that five-year period. And so it's, at some point I just decided the five-year mission is a point of departure. It's a setting. It's it's like Riverdale, or it's Springfield, or it's you know, uh, it's just it's just a place where you can begin to tell a story. Uh, I quit worrying about trying to order everything or to make you know, did everything happen in the order? I just it's that part is not fun. The, the part for me is there's always a new story that I could tell with these characters. Um, and yes, I try to honor what's come before and I definitely respect what's on screen. So if I have to pick, you know, I just, I kind of just pretend that some of those novels don't take place so I can f find a spot where I can set my story in relation to the television series. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, that kind of leads into something then that I want to talk about that is our, our poll question tonight. Um, it, it's a trigger word for you. I know. <laughs> for me, it is too. So I want to get to the bottom of it. But I, I think it's going to be a nice chunk of our discussion here. So before we get to that, we're going to do a little bit of business and then we'll come right back to it and we'll talk about the C word. Okay. So I'm going to press that. Then we'll come back and we'll talk about the C word, okay? I'm going to I'm going to pregame for that right now. Yeah, good, so. good. That's, that's what we do. Just here. just so people don't think they have to turn it off. Canon is the C word. Oh, no, so he said it. Now, I, just, I just, but I just want to. I just, you know, want to make sure, sure that people are like, oh, get the kids out of the room because yeah. my goodness, we're going to talk about. <laughs> going to talk about something I'm not sure the kids should be talking about. Uh, I don't think uh, I've yes. violated the rating yet, have I? You know? No, no, not yet. Not yet. You're good. You're good so far. Uh, yes, uh, we do have a bit of business to deal with, as, as John mentioned a moment ago, and it's a, a word from our good friends at Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Discovery Starships collection. Yes. OK, so we're done seeing the Discovery Starships move around on the screen right now. What you have to do is bring them into your house so you can see them, you know, move around right there in front of you. In fact, I think, John. I, I can't see you, John, because I'm seeing something else, but you have yeah. your Shenzo right there, right? I do, I do. Yeah. I am, yeah, in fact, moving it around on the screen. Excellent, so excellent. That I'm so you can it. actually still uh, see it move on the screen. It's yep. just not quite as majestic as... <laughs> uh, this is full of majesty, Ken. This all right, majesty, all right. Right here. So Eagle Boss wants you to get a Discovery Starship of your own or ships from the Discovery line. Uh, you know, a bunch of different ships that they have available as part of the Discovery uh, Starships collection. That's right. So on the Federation side, you've got ships like the Shenzhou and the Discovery, the Corella, the Jaeger, the Europa. Then flying in from Klingon space, you've got ships like the reimagined Klingon Bird of Prey and the Koch class destroyer. Nicely done, sir. What Thank you'll you. see when you visit eaglemoss.com slash discovery starships are renderings that serve as the basis for the diecast models themselves, painstakingly reproduced as always under the supervision of Star Trek expert Ben Robinson. Officially licensed by CBS, as we say, about eight to 10 inches long from bow to stern, depending on the ship. Each is hand painted, each is rich in detail, and each comes with an awesome magazine full of all the real world and in universe information that I personally groove on. And of course, each comes with a display stand uh, suitable for displaying your ship. By the way, John McQuillan says that I have to make the whoosh sound or it doesn't count. So whoosh, there you go. Subscribers will get their first ship, the USS Shenzhou NCC-1227, for only $9.95 with free shipping. Additional models, including the iconic USS Discovery NCC-1031, will then ship monthly for the special subscriber price of only $44.95 each. That's 20% off the standard retail price also with free shipping. Now, if you'd rather pick and choose just the ships you want, you can do that. 
Uh, for that, you go to shop.eaglemoss.com or you can check your local comic shop. You're going to pay about 10 bucks more there, but saving money is not the only reason to subscribe. Uh, subscribers also get free gifts worth over $100 during their subscription. And of course, if you change your mind, you can cancel your subscription at any time. So to subscribe, eaglemoss.com slash discovery starships. To buy individually, go to shop.eaglemoss.com. And a huge thanks to Eagle Moss for sponsoring this week's show. And by the way, Chris Riker saying that that's the worst whoosh ever. Chris, you send us your own whoosh. Maybe we'll patch that into an ad in the future, okay? That's, uh, <laughs> let's say not a promise to you, Chris. They don't really whoosh anymore, though. They just kind of hum. They do. They? Like, they do, yeah. Or they go... <laughs> When they're doing oh, like that, the, true. The, yeah, the, it's the, true. The yeah. Uh-huh. You, you throw it up in the air, you flip it like a coin, and then <laughs> <laughs> imagine it's taking off. Right. I want to remind people they can get in touch with us right now. Uh, you can use the one tap on your iPhone. You can click on the Zoom link above or below this video. You can pick up the phone like a caveman and call 646-558-8656. <laughs> 646 uh, you'll enter the meeting code that you see on the screen, and you'll be talking to John and Dayton and me. Cool. All right. So, Dayton, when we left off, <laughs> we were there on the verge of talking about something very important, so important that we made it our poll question tonight. Are the Star Trek novels canon? I believe when we left off, it was about, uh, what, 70% saying no, 30% saying yes. And um, I believe, I, I don't know if we have it up on the screen right now, but we have, a, we have an image where you've been memed talking <laughs> about canon. Yeah, I, I believe it is on screen right now. And I'm, uh, I'm very happy with that image. Uh, tell us why you created that image. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, Thank you. Yes. I, I just, I don't understand how it can tie so many people into so many knots, you know? Yeah. Um, now, does the poll question ask, are they canon or should they be canon? Should. Should they be? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. That's a good question. We, we know they're question. not. We know specifically yeah. they're not. Yeah. They're, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, to the 30% who have voted in favor of that, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, uh, I understand. And to the 70% of you who are voting against it, I get it. I get you. I feel you. Um, as a fan, you know, I used to. I used to think about that stuff all the time. And then at some point I just had this revelation, like, why am I bothering myself with this? Why am I letting other people dictate to me the terms on which I will be entertained by something? Uh, as far as, you know, degrees of reality, um, as a, you know, the only people who really should care about the canon are the people who are making the shows. And those of us who have deal with the licensed properties, if you're just a fan, then and if you dig it, then it happened. Um, that's how I look at it. I mean, for, you know, to, as far as I'm concerned, f- the Vanguard novels happened and, <laughs> you know, and the children shall lead never happened. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Can- you're missing, you're missing a whole world of motivation. <laughs> speaking if you're not paying attention to, and the children shall lead. Oh That's my God. I actually, that is quoted, the- actually quoted it at somebody the other day, as you believe, so shall you do. <laughs> so shall you do. If I thought there was so a way sure. I could cut out that section of the Blu-ray so that it never <laughs> polluted my office or my home ever again, it's, I would do that. You know, it's a terrible, terrible episode with uh, with some really wonderful ideas, <laughs> I think. But we can talk about that. You just hey, described me. the whole third season of, Noah, of the TOS. Uh, that's, that's quite possible. Yeah. That's yeah, quite yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, so uh, forgive me, because I know you've just said, you know, your head explodes when you ask this question. Yet this goes back to the question I was asking you earlier. Okay, so you say the novels are not canon. Is that true for Desperate Hours and Drastic Measures, where they're being written so closely? I mean, literally... Here's how close, and again, not to keep harkening back to it, but here's how close that story was to Burnham's speech. I honestly was trying to remember which episode it was that she had told that story, and I couldn't believe that they were using practically the same words again. And then I remembered, oh, wait, that's right. I read that. I didn't see that. I mean, are these, I mean, would you still say the novels aren't canon, or are you going back to, oh, yeah, that time in uh, M. Zadi when, <laughs> when Riker went through the Guardian of Forever? Oh, no, he didn't. Okay. He did. I mean, what? No. My what? whole life is a lie now. That's not canon. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Dayton. Apparently that's not canon. But is that is that still true for the books that are out that are coming out now? The problem the thing with books being canon is that 
even if they say today these books are canon, you know, next year you get a different producer and a different showrunner and they change their sure. mind. And yeah. so, you know, yes, we and Dave in particular with his book went to an extraordinary length to coordinate with Kirsten and other members of the writing staff. And they in turn utilized some of the stuff that he established uh, in his novel to help fill out backstory for the characters. That's about as close as it's going to get, in my opinion. Now, they have not come down one way or the other with a decree. Uh, so I'm just going to ride the wave and see what happens. Um, if they come out with, you know, if Lorca makes a prime appearance in season two and he talks about that time on Tarsus 4, you will hear me cheer from my <laughs> house in Kansas City. But I'm not putting my chips on that on that number. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, it just doesn't. It, you know, it's 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 not, and it's not even a case of malice or or ill intent. It's just you know they they get an idea about where they want to take Lorca's character, and it doesn't jive with what was established in the novel. Well, that's the way that goes. Um, you know that, that the job was dangerous. We knew that when we took it, uh, and that's just the way tie-in writing is in general. Yeah, I know you you said earlier that TOS is your track. When you think about Star Trek, that's the one you think about. I don't want to ask so much about your favorite kind of series, but I do want to ask about your favorite kind of story. Like like when you think about, okay, so what is a good Star Trek story? Is it the we're wrestling with a moral dilemma? Is it a we've got to get it over on the bad guy? Is it a godlike being and we don't know what we're doing? Is it a holodeck episode? What are the ones that like when you're watching them, you're like, oh yeah, that's 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 really good. That's <laughs> You know, what I love about Star Trek uh, is that there's no one kind of Star Trek story. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the setting and the characters are such that you can do pretty much anything with them. Uh, that said, I do like the moral play, the morality plays or the moral dilemma. Those are those are probably my favorite. And then every once in a while, I just like a good old fashioned action adventure story. So I'll like Arena. Or Balance of Terror but I'll also like the doomsday machine. You know, I love episodes like in the pale moonlight or living witness or something like that. So they're all, I mean, I'm all over the map when it comes to what I think of as a good star Trek story, because the shows have proven over the years, you can do so many different things uh, in the format. I don't and know if that's an answer or an evasion, you know? No, or, no, it's a, you know. it's a fine answer. I still don't understand though. Your hatred for, and the children shall leave. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Just, like episodes where the plot requires <laughs> the characters to act out of character in order for the plot to proceed. Yeah. So, so I, that thought rules, complaint, yeah. I thought your complaint might be having a character to stand there and explain for five minutes how the show is actually working. This is true. That and anybody who comes to work dressed in a shower curtain, I'm already going to take points off. I see. Well, so. yes, yes. But a lawyer in a shower curtain. He was really a lawyer. True. He was a lawyer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mark Hill says, serious question. Why is 47 significant? I really don't know. Dayton, do you, do you plant 47 throughout your novels? I don't do it as often as other people do. I mean, uh, <laughs> but it has happened on occasion. Um it's just one of those things. It's like the Wilhelm scream of Star Trek. You know, it, uh, <laughs> you, you got to throw it in there once in a while. I mean, we, we even built an entire series of novels around a star base number 47 um, because we just had to. It's like it, could, it can't be any other number. Any other number would be sacrilege. Oh, great way um, to go. Holly just said, yay, 47. All right. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> there was something. There was one thing, though, in, uh, in Discovery. I can't remember what the number was now, but basically they said that something had happened and it was 46. And both John and I were like credits of discovery and the well, opening you know, credits of discovery. Yeah. You see all the numbers in the, right. the sketches, kind of the design work. And one of those is 46. And it's like, you know what? They just they knew what they were doing. They were just tweaking the audience. <laughs> what was the what was the tagline for Discovery's teaser trailers before the show premiered? Like, you know, uh challenge your expectations or something like that. Oh, okay. So, you know, that fits right in with Discovery's theme of just sort of, you know, moving the pieces around the board a little bit differently. Right. So. Right. So, um, yeah, oh, this is funny. So uh, Gina in the uh, online chat here, she says, uh, Dayton's solution to dealing with canon as a young fan was to become one of the people who actually has influence on production of media, or at least is informed in the uh, pre-production stage. Get stressed about what you think Star Trek should be. Quick fix, control the content, or embody <laughs> insider trading style. Best <laughs> logic ever. Someone is channeling Vulcan I. I'm impressed. <laughs> I could totally, I could totally work with that explanation right there. That'll work okay. for me. 
<laughs> so I got to ask you then, actually, sort of to that end, um, and this is moving away from the novels and into something else that probably most people aren't that into. I personally am huge into it, though. I've actually got the book over there. Um, you got to write some of the adventure ideas for uh, the the RPG Star Trek Adventures, right? Uh, not 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 the actual adventures. Uh, I helped develop the storyline for what they were calling the Living Campaign, uh, mm-hmm. which is underway as we speak, uh, and it's evolving as we speak. Uh, I helped lay down the initial beats for that. Uh, I worked with Scott Pearson, who's also uh, done some Star Trek novels, uh, Star Star Trek stories in the past. Uh, he and I worked uh, up together on that, along with Jim Johnson, who also does a, a great deal of work for the game right now. For people who don't know, because um, RPG can mean so many different things, I saw something the other day about an RPG that's coming out for the iPhone. And my thinking is, mm, it's not exactly an RPG because you're going to be much more limited in what you're doing. I mean, I'm talking about, and and Star Trek Adventures is more a uh, role-playing game along the lines of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's a like pencil, yeah, it's a it's a pen and paper game or a pen and uh, pencil and paper game. Yeah, uh, right. uh, role-playing game. With a slew of dice, just a ton uh, of dice. A ton of dice, yeah. So you did not What's... mean rocket-propelled grenade. That is not. No, I didn't. <laughs> not, this, not, not this time. I did not mean that in this context. No. Okay. All right. So. Good. Good to know. I- so, I mean, what's really, what's what's cool about RPGs, I mean, to me, is you're making up your own kinds of stories. And so if people can actually make up their own kinds of Star Trek stories as well. I mean, obviously, you've got a game master who's who's trying to guide the story a certain way. But if you've got cantankerous players, the story is not necessarily going to go where he wants it to or she wants it to. Right. Um, how is it different writing for that kind of thing? I mean, I, I got to figure you've got as an author, I got to figure you're a little bit into control because you're moving every <laughs> character exactly where they're going to go and you're having them say exactly what you want them to say and you probably write it 10 times before they're saying exactly what you want them to say. What's it like to write a framework knowing that other people are going to run around and play in it or maybe just get distracted by one rock that you accidentally happened to mention in paragraph one? <laughs> You've, uh, that was actually the biggest challenge. Um, when they asked me to do this, they, you know, they wanted me to lay out the entire um, – storyline and backstory not out not all of which you know is being revealed to the character or to the players as they proceed i mean they get bits and pieces as they progress through the campaign Mm -hmm. Um, my biggest challenge because i was writing a framework that other writers would then use as a springboard to create the the adventures you're talking about the modules you know the actual game play um was not closing off all the avenues it's like i'm going to lay out all this stuff but yet I got to keep it open-ended enough that other people can come in and plug in pieces or stitch in another section of the quilt, if you will. Um, and yeah, so it was just more of like just thinking more broadly and not, not trying to lay down all the pieces of a plot. It was, it was, it was different. I had to, I had to learn. I had to, I had to kind of feel my way and then reach out to other people. Am I doing this right? Um, Jim and Scott were very helpful and other folks at Modifius, uh, Chris and Sam at Modifius were very helpful in that regard as well. Uh, by the way, Ken, we had a really quick correction here from a couple of our listeners. I wanted to make sure that you were referring to space dice, um, not just regular dice, but space dice. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. okay. If you've actually, if you've looked at Star Trek Adventures, you're not joking. They've, yeah. got, they've got so many different kinds of dice that you can. The good news is you don't have to buy all the dice, uh, that, but you can, uh, and it won't bankrupt you but it uh, it will sure give it its best shot. It'll cost you a penny or two. I know we have a caller, but I have one more yep. question before we move off of the uh, before we move off the RPG thing. Uh, were you are you an RPG person, or was this like a hey, you know Star Trek, we need backstory? I played RPGs, and I'm not going to say how many years ago, but it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, some of your listeners may not have been born yet. I don't know. Um, I played. <laughs> I tried to play Dungeons and Dragons as a kid, and I discovered that I just am not a fantasy person. I, I prefer science fiction over fantasy, so I gravitated toward things like t- uh, TSR at that time had another game called Star Frontiers, which was a space opera themed RPG. And then FASA came out with their Star Trek role playing game. So mm-hmm. I just dated myself. There you go. Preach, um, preach. Yeah, there you couldn't go. get yeah. couldn't get into the dragons, man. I don't groove on having. Drag- Having uh, having been a role playing game person, uh, dating yourself tends to be one of the things that happens when you no. get to RPGs. <laughs> <laughs> but then you grow up, and 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 it's like, oh, you have imagination. It turns out you're actually a 
cooler than people realized at the time. Hey, let's jump over to Kim. We have Kim on the line, longtime listener and contributor to our live show. Kim, are you there? I am here. Hey, there you are, Kim. Yeah, good evening. Good to see you Uh, tonight. Yeah, good, good, good to see you guys back. And I'm glad you had Dayton on. I I actually have a question for Dayton and uh, and some comments just on some of the stuff we've been talking about already. Please go Uh, right ahead. So, so Dayton, I'm wondering, are you are you contracted? Are you going to be doing more discovery books? I I actually just literally started your book today because I just finished the first one. So, and I was pleasantly surprised to see you're writing about uh, Prime Lorca. So, uh, and I'm not too far in, but uh, so far I, I like it. But I'm curious if you you've got some more that you're going to be working on. Well, um, we're at a weird point right now with uh, Simon and Schuster and CBS. They're still figuring out a licensing agreement, a new licensing agreement, so that Pocketbooks can continue to publish Star Trek novels. Um, I'm told that they our finalizing agreement and we should be hearing something shortly. Uh, when that happens, um, I'm hoping that they will call me and put me back to work, uh, writing more star Trek, whether that's discovery or one of the other shows, I guess it remains to see be seen, but I would be totally up for another discovery novel if the opportunity arose. Okay, great. I hope, I hope that's the case. Um, I would like to write a captain Tilly novel if they let me. But <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Would you write a Captain Tilly or a Captain Killy? Yes, I would. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Nice. Well, the RPG stuff, that's funny you bring that up. Uh, did that a lot when I was younger, too. So, uh, Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. Actually, ran a, uh, a text based one via email for the longest time. Interesting. I remember when I was a kid, you could you could subscribe or join or whatever they call it, but it was a play by mail Star Trek game. So you'd get a bunch of stuff in the mail and it have like moves or turns or whatever, and then you do your thing and then you mail it. And I guess it takes like six years to play a game. At this, <laughs> at this you know, I I don't know. I I, I never did yeah, get to the end of that it. game. Yeah, it was. Right. But I mean, you know, hey, it was it was pre internet. You know, it was pre everything. It was back when the world was black and white. So. Oh yeah, yeah. We used to play them on bulletin boards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actual bulletin boards with thumbtacks. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. I like your idea actually of playing by mail. At the end of year one, you're out of space talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I, I did try to play uh, Starfleet Battles. Have you ever seen that game? It's like a See tabletop. That? It's a tabletop Star Trek game where you. It's more. The emphasis is more on ship to ship combat. Oh. And I, tr- they tried to teach me this game one Saturday afternoon, and I swear it was like six hours before the ships moved three spaces toward each other on this massive game <laughs> grid. And I'm like, I'm out. I'm going to the beach. I was living in California at the time. I'm like, I'm out. I'm going to the beach. So, yeah, I actually, this is embarrassing and really far too geeky. But uh, there was a game called Car Wars back in the day, and a friend of mine and I spent probably two and a half to three hours building our cars. And then we took our first turns, and uh, and I took a hard left, and my car flipped over, and he just shot, and that was it. We were done. We never like, played yeah. the game again. Right. Yeah. Somewhere out there is a beer with my name on it. I'm going to go find it. Right. That was pretty oh, much no. it. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Kim, do you have anything else for us tonight? Uh, no, other than that, comment on uh, the books, the Star Trek books. I've read a fair number of them. There's so many of them, I have yet to read them all, but. Um, I, they have their place, and I, I think that gives an avenue for other stories to be told. So, are they canon? Well, I don't know. <laughs> That's a C word again. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I enjoy reading them, so keep well, on making them. I think that's really what it's all about. Is it do do you enjoy reading it? Do you enjoy the story? That that's really what it comes down to. I, I think fans could drive themselves nuts trying to force everything to fit, and to me, that just sucks all the fun out of fandom. So I'm um, glad that you uh, enjoyed them. Any uh, particular of Dayton's books that uh, that you've really enjoyed? Um, actually, I can't remember if I've read other ones. I am so behind. I've got the books that I gravitate to, or like the that I remember reading, because <laughs> I've just gotten back into kind of doing that. Was uh, 
uh, the things back like anxiety, you had talked about it and uh, right. Blackfire and some of those early Simon and Schuster pocketbooks. Oh, sure. Yeah. A lot of people in the, uh, in the comments talking about Anzati, uh, let's see, uh, somebody recommending seekers two and four. Right there. <laughs> Thanks mom. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope that you will call back soon. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me on and good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We'll thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, I want to remind people really quickly, uh, in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, there is another show from the Roddenberry Podcast Network firing up. Uh, stay here on Facebook and catch the live recording of Priority One, also a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. Uh, each Tuesday at about 5, 10 past uh, 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, and other times, other places, Elijah, Kenna, Tony, and others bring you news from all over the Star Trek multiverse. Uh, TV and movie news, gaming news, literary reviews. Actually, they were the ones, that's how I found out that Star Trek Adventures was finally available, uh, was uh, watching Priority One. So tons of stuff there. They kick off, as I say, about 5 or 10 past 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, every Tuesday night live on Facebook. So when we're done here, go over there and, uh, and keep the Star Trek party rolling. Hey, uh, Dayton, as we kind of wrap things up tonight, I want to ask you about uh, the Starfleet Corps of Engineers, because I know that that has been a really successful series for you. Um, and you, you co-write that with uh, Kevin Delmore, correct? We did, yeah. It's uh, It's been sort of, I guess, on a permanent hiatus now for the last several years, though. Oh, really? Why, yeah. uh, I mean, I, because they, they did quite well, from what I understand. Well, the funny thing about that is, you know, we we kind of were ahead of the whole ebook thing by about a decade mm -hmm. <laughs> the first ones of those series came out in late 2000 and then uh, they ran for uh 70 odd 70 i want to say 76 installments on a monthly basis they were cranking out a new one of these novellas yeah um and it was for a while it was sort of a farm team uh folks who wrote for that series eventually in some cases you know got called up to the majors so to speak to write for the main novel line um that's kind of how Dave Matt got into the groove in particular. Uh, he worked, he wrote several of the SCE novellas and then got called up to write. He, I think he and Kevin and I sort of got there about the same time. We were both called in to work on a, on a mini series project. Um, and that's how we ended up getting into the major rotation or the, you know, the main rotation of novelists for pocket. And, and I want to know what the inspiration was there, because it, it, it seems very obvious to me that it, it, it's, you, you watch an episode of Star Trek and uh, something might go horribly well or horribly wrong. And uh, let's say the Enterprise flies off after destabilizing a civilization or removing a <laughs> false god. Somebody has to come along and pick up the pieces. Got that, it in one. That is exactly that is exactly the one line pitch. That, damage that's control. Really? Okay. Oh wow. Okay. Remember the remember the damage control comics where the the group comes in after the superheroes fight and destroy the city and they come and clean everything up. Sure. Yeah. So that's that's that's, that's what that. Starfleet Corps of Engineers was. That's is Star Trek's <laughs> damage control. Yeah. Kirk talks the computer to death and then flies off to his next mission and leaves the whole planet in chaos. Right. Somebody's got to come in and clean up the mess. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. so you you were watching uh, what Return of the Archons? You're like, oh. God, this is going to be a mess the next day. <laughs> we actually wrote a novella that was a sequel to that based on that exact oh. idea. He turned off Landrew and then flew away, that bastard. Yep. Send, yeah. in, the, send in the cream, the cleaners, you know. What uh, what happens to the feeders of Vol after, uh, yes. after they're gone? I mean, we know yeah. what they're doing, but like eventually they have to stop doing that and they have to pick up the pieces. And they also get to occasionally play with some, you know, uh, alien, purloined alien technology or whatever. Okay. And so they're the ones who get to like, you know, when we, when we turn off the doomsday machine, you know, or we deactivate the doomsday machine, they get to drag it back to a, a lab somewhere and start picking it apart. Yeah. That sounds safe. Yeah. Yeah. That's nothing. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? So. <laughs> nice. Well, I, I, I love the concept and I, I love that I got it right. I, I, that's that uh, was, uh, that was Keith the Canada and uh, Ordo, John Ordover, who was at the time an editor at pocket books. They, they came up with that concept. Cool. Uh, yeah. Earl Green says it's called a spinoff and you'll like it. <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. <laughs> so uh, I think I started by asking how it is you got started. I, as we uh, come very close to the end of the show, what's your suggestion for anybody who is interested going forward? Like if somebody says, I've always had an idea for a story, but I never, or I have this story, but I don't know what to do with it. I mean, what are, 
on the one hand, I would think the internet opens up so many possibilities as far as places people might be able to go. On the other hand, everybody and his brother's writing something at this point. I mean, what, what would your suggestion be for somebody who's interested in, uh, in, in uh, dabbling or more? Uh, other than don't send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about Star Trek or just anything? Uh, in general, like just, I mean, in general or just writing in general? Yeah. Or writing for Star Trek. I mean, well, golly, I, you uh, know, two different questions with two different yeah, possible answers. Are, you're right. Um, let's go with let's go with writing in general, I suppose, uh, because I mean, you have to do that before you can write Star Trek. That's generally the rule. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to write though. I mean, I, I get so many questions. People ask me, how do you know? I want to be a writer. What do I do? Well, you sit down and you start writing. That's how it starts. Uh, easier said than done, which is why not everybody does it. Um, and you know, and, and accept that it's a it's a process. You're gonna you're gonna write. What you write is not gonna be very good at first. You're gonna write some more. It's gonna improve. You know, and eventually you're gonna get to space where you like the completed story that you've got there. And then you decide do you want to write just for fun or you want to try to write for publication. And then you know that's a whole other set of wickets you have to try to navigate. Um, you know, don't set unrealistic goals. Don't say I'm gonna get published by the time I'm 30 or. I'm going to be a Hugo winner by the time I'm 50. Those are not in your control. All you can do is write and finish what you start and then do it again and then do it again and then do it to a point where it's just, you can't not do it. Uh, that's writing right there. Is the hardest part to get people to understand that they actually have to sit down and write or that the first thing they write is going to suck? Yeah. That, that, and yeah, as I say, the harsher way I said is you're going to write and you're going to suck and you're going to write some more and you're going to suck. You're going to suck less and you're going to keep doing that until you eventually you don't suck. And whether you suck or not is not necessarily an objective <laughs> qualifier. You know what I mean? Right. Like you might think you're the greatest author ever. The editor that just bought your story might think you're the greatest author ever. Then you go on Amazon and nobody <laughs> likes your stuff. And that's well, when you that's, learn about how thick your skin should be. You know, That's uh, not fair because nobody's popular on Amazon except for the people who are. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I don't read Amazon reviews. Or if I do, I don't, I don't take them to heart good or bad you know i just uh, i appreciate the good ones and i try to ignore the really harsh ones uh, unless the, unless there's something in there that i can learn from you know if it's a, if it's a harsh critique but i can learn from it i'll take it to heart but if it's just somebody being snarky i don't i don't worry about it Dayton, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. And uh, for anybody who hasn't noticed it on screen, they can go to DaytonWard.com to find out more about you. I assume that you have links to your books there. So people who are curious and uh, maybe want to pick up a title or two can do it there. You can find everything about me there. That's my uh, launch pad for social media, uh, blog, Literally Facebook, everything. Twitter, everything. Yeah, so. to, to just a, a, a painful degree, everything about you at DaytonWard.com. I'm so sorry for that. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for coming on the show tonight. Really appreciate talking Trek with you anytime. So uh, we hope you'll come back. And uh, thanks to our listeners who chimed in tonight, uh, both on the Facebook chat and, uh, and on calls with us. So uh, I guess that about wraps it up. And uh, Ken, if you want to uh, regale everybody with the credits, we'll wrap this up. I'd be more than happy to. Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Executive producer, Rod Roddenberry. Technical production on Mission Log Live by Infinity Networks. Producer, Brandon Bradley. Be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest Roddenberry Podcast Network updates, including not just Mission Log and Mission Log Live, but also Women at Warp, Priority One, and The Trek Files. We would again like to thank Eagle Moss and the official Star Trek Starships collection for sponsoring this show, Check out their fine wares at eaglemoss.com slash Discovery Starships. All right. Groovy.